Having trouble with navel orange worm in the orchard? Sidetrack, now miso mating disruption is your best bet to minimize loss and maximize profitability. Used with Tresse's new multi-gender lures for your monitoring program, you can achieve the quality yields you deserve. Contact your local sales rep today. Hello, I'm Matthew Malcolm with California Ag Network reporting to you from the annual convention of the Almond Alliance of California here at Huntington Beach. Uh, a lot of hot topics addressed today, including water. And we had a great panel, which Michelle Reimers uh, from the Turlock Irrigation District participated in. There's all, obviously a lot of negatives uh, to talk about, but you had some positive things to share about today. But first off, I wanted to say, so, so what is the allocation this year for Turlock uh, as far as water goes, and, and how does that compare with some years in the past? Sure. So uh, Turlock Irrigation District is a little bit different than other water agencies in the state. Uh, we do not rely on the state or federal water projects. Uh, we own and operate our system, uh, which gives us the ability to uh, set allocations ourselves and to plan accordingly for longer periods of drought. And so with that, we were able to start reductions two years ago to our growers. And this year, we're about 50 percent uh, in terms of an allocation, if you will. Um, and, you know, we're a district that uses surface water, but we also have a conjunctive use program, which means you know we recharge in the wet years and then we use the groundwater in in these drought periods. So, and how is this impacting you know the growers in in, in your in your region? You know it's tight. Majority of the crops are permanent, which makes it very hard to fallow. But I think 27 inches with the ability to be able to use groundwater to help supplement, they're able to sustain you know, that, that permanent crop. Um, we also have a lot of dairy, uh, and any forage crop that we have is actually used to support the dairy industry for feed. So again, not much in terms of you know, using fallowing as a mechanism to deal with drought like other areas in the state. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting you know, circumstance to be in. And, and appreciate that you're, you know, think, think considering that in, in, in your, your efforts to make sure they get what they need. Um, you, you mentioned today in the panel that there's some, some new projects and new ways you're trying to make, you know, the, the limited water we have get to the end of the row. Can you tell us about that? Well, I'd first like to take the opportunity to talk about how we manage our water um, at the watershed level because I think that's really important, uh, especially in drought periods like this. So we have our, a team of hydrologists and we use new technology, it's called the Airborne Snow Observatory, in which we uh, use LIDAR um, to measure the snowpack content. Uh, we also work with Scripps Institute of Oceanography to um, utilize a tool, it's called Forecast Inform Reservoir Operations. Essentially. They're looking at atmospheric rivers and wind um, and how warm they're coming. Uh, that in combination with that, you know, knowing the snow content, we're able to better manage what's coming into our reservoirs. Um, and, and that's that's unique to your irrigation district. That doesn't happen everywhere, right? The state is not using that currently, and which you know, it's hopeful that we can be a good role model for the state to use as as you know, a, a product that's actually working uh, in terms of water con conservation. Um, the other thing that we're a little unique on, we have one of the only hourly modeling um, that is used in the state. So again, the state and federal projects use a different model. Uh, ours is specifically designed for the Tuolumne. So we have over 125 years of data that's used in this model in, in conjunction with the tools I just talked to you about, about the ASO and the atmospheric rivers. And so it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic model. And again, the hourly component is very significant. Um, so that's kind of how we manage on, on the upper end of the system. Um, because we manage the reservoir our, ourselves, we're able to, like I said, use that information to present to our board of directors so they can make decisions of you know, what allocations will be given that year. Uh, the ability lets us stretch out our water supply for longer periods of time. And that's just been our ability to survive these longer periods of drought. Uh, we're not a typical reservoir in terms of fill and spill. You'll hear, hear that. You know, they fill up one year and then they release it all out. Our storage was built to weather, no pun intended, um, long-term, you know, drought periods. So we have um, some exciting projects that we're going to pursue. Um, one is raising our spillway at Don Pedro Reservoir. 
Uh, Don Pedro is the reservoir where we um, store our water. It's about 2 million thousand acre foot reservoir. Um, the raising of the spillway would gain us about 100,000 acre feet. Um, and we have conducted a feasibility study and are back in 2016 and we're updating the numbers. Obviously costs have gone up dramatically, um, but we want to pursue that. Uh, in addition, we're looking at coordinating with irrigation districts and the Bureau on um, the new Maloney system, the Stanislaus, and to look for, uh, you know, some agreement to study a feasibility of actually interconnecting the two reservoirs. Um, and, you know, we, we want to study the same for, you know, the southern and looking at McClure. So, um, again, these those two are kind of higher level. We haven't kicked anything off, you know, sort of, you know, in terms of, you know, conducting the feasibility study. That's what we want to do now. But I think at this point, every water manager is looking at creative solutions, maybe some things that you laughed at in the late 80s or early 90s. Uh, there's off-stream reservoirs that we're are analyzing as well. Um, and then there's also, you know, our system was built, we're 135 years old. It's a gravity-fed system. Um, it's meant to spill, and that's okay. That's the way it was engineered to do. But in a world like this, where water is so precious, we're also looking at how can we automate um, our system for water conservation? And it's just a lot of money and time, but we have invested over $60 million at this point already in our system to try to help uh, save literally every drop we can. Wow, so you got some, you got some long-term yep. projects and some, short hopefully term. some short-term mm -hmm. impacts uh, from some of these things that you guys are working on. How, how, will, this, how will this impact our, our growers in the near future? Uh, well, one project I didn't mention, we implemented in 2018, it's what's called a regulating reservoir. So our system is completely gravity fed. And, you know, if you're at the very end of the system, you're calling on the water at a very higher end. And you sure hope that you know, we calculated it right, right? And that you're not shorted. And so what we've done actually is recreated a reservoir in the middle of our system, actually closer to the end of the system to where we can capture that. And then we can actually re-release that water like we do at our reservoir. Uh, the benefits that we've seen is uh, better water quality. Um, we've also seen better customer service. Um, growers are able to call and get their water much quicker um, and to get their full you know, allotment, if you will. And then uh, the other thing that's actually happened is the groundwater levels around that area have actually risen because of the, our ability to serve them more quickly. They're not tapping into the ground. And so we're getting some savings in terms of um, sustainability in that area. So we pursued one and we're pursuing another. Um, this year we actually received a $2 million grant from uh, the Bureau of Reclamation to move forward on that. So we're really excited about that. So I think the efforts that we ta are taking are, are helping our growers. Um, but unfortunately Mother Nature you know, has a say in some of that, but we're doing the very best we can um, to help out. We've created a new farmer to farmer transfer program, something that we haven't done. Um, and you know, uh, we've also created some online tools that growers can log in and look at, you know, here's my water allocation for the irrigation season. And they can actually plug in what they th where they think they're going to irrigate and see wh how much water they have left. And um, it's been really helpful. Uh, our average far acres of farming is about 30 acres. Um, so we don't have these huge, large farms. And so a lot of these people um, have full-time jobs too, yeah. right? And so uh, giving them the tools and resources to help them plan out their irrigation uh, has been an, uh, super helpful for them. That's great. Uh, really appreciate your example in the industry and hope yeah. more the, more irrigation districts and, and such will take, will take some of those things and apply them. You know, we have huge water issues and, and I know it may seem just so daunting but these small and it may you know they may seem small and simple things, but by those small and simple things, great things can come to pass. So thank you for for what you're doing. Read more about these things in our publications. I'm Matthew Malcolm, CaliforniaAgnet.com.